mentioned in various places. Firstly, hello. Been a while. You're probably looking at the screen like, who is this person? Who is, who is she? 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 Because I've not made a video in quite some time. Maybe a month? I don't know. It's been a while. So, I'm not going to apologise because... I would say I've been doing stuff, I haven't been doing stuff. But it's because I haven't been doing stuff that I haven't been posting any videos. Really, you should be thanking me from saving you from watching really boring videos. Little update on what I've been up to? Nothing. Nothing. That's a lie. I have been doing things just at home so I don't really feel like I've been doing anything because I haven't actively been going places and expending physical energy. I've been at home working on my next novel with this kiss, um, which has been great. I've, I just love the editing stage. The first draft is done, so this is me getting notes back from my editor to work on parts of the book, and I always feel like the first draft is the hardest part of writing because it's literally creating something. If the editing process is like moulding the clay. The first draft process is like making clay. It's like creating clay out of nothing. And that's the bit that I find the hardest. But then once it's all out, I'm like, there is a story in front of me as opposed to in my head. The editing process is like problem solving. And now that is my fave. I love that. That is just the best bit. I love moving pieces of the puzzle round, taking puzzle pieces away and putting other puzzle pieces in their place until suddenly you start to see a full picture. That excites me to no end. My book is in three parts. I've done part one and part two. I am now editing part three. Part one and part two have been sent back off to my editor for another round of notes. Exciting times! So I have been busy, but I have not been doing anything that is video worthy. However, something else that I have been doing, I will mention in a moment, because I want to get on to this, this video with the lovely background. Being at home means I have had more time for reading and this makes me happy. I've missed reading so much. I feel like I've been in a reading slump for like two or three years. But now, if I'm taking any positives from lockdown, it's the fact that I have read more than I have ever read, maybe in my life. I don't remember reading this much since school, I don't think. So, happy, happy times. I did my January book roundup on Instagram, but for some reason I just, I feel like I wanna do this one on YouTube. I find IGTV videos really hard to edit. That's what it is. I don't, I haven't got that down yet. IGTV scares me. So here we are. So without further ado, here are my February reads. The first book was The Lucky Escape by Laura Jane Williams. Um, this is a proof copy. I was very kindly sent a copy of this because as I mentioned maybe like a minute ago, um, one of the reasons that I had to leave the house and to go somewhere and actually do something was to narrate the audiobook of this, The Lucky Escape. I narrated the previous two novels from this author, um, which are Our Stop and The Love Square. I did The Love Square last year and Our Stop the year previous. Um, so it was lovely to do her third novel as well and sort of complete the set, which was great. This is out June 2021. So you've got a little bit of time to wait. So this book is about a woman who is called Annie. She is jilted at the altar, left waiting at the altar at the very beginning of the book. And her in-laws, would have been in-laws, tell her to just take the honeymoon, which was a three week trip to Australia. Um, they were like, we can't get the money back. We can't do anything about it. Just go on the honeymoon. But then she meets an old friend from her like teenage years called Patrick and conversations happen. They have like a drunken night together. Um, just where they like go out for a drink. I made that sound way more sexy than it actually was. Um, they just have a drunken night together and they're like, hey, let's go on the honeymoon together. And then they wake up and they still think that's a really good idea. So they go on the honeymoon together. An adventure ensues. I've never been to Australia. It made me want to go to Australia. Technically, I read this book twice this month because I read it once before I did the audiobook and then I read it doing the audiobook. Um, however, I will not count that. This is just 
the one book. There's a lot of um, introspective conversations that Annie has that I really enjoyed. She does a lot of self-reflection, um, which I'm sure is only natural when you've been jilted the altar and the relationship you had with someone suddenly just is over and is out the window and you start to question, was the relationship really what I thought it was? Um, and I really enjoyed those conversations within this book. I think it's a really fun read and there's some slightly steamier scenes in there as well for those of you that like slightly um, hot scenes. Why did I just turn into Miranda Hart? So yeah, for anyone who likes a steamy, romantic, fun read, The Lucky Escape is for you. The next book is another proof copy, another arc, um, which is The Summer Job by Lizzie Dent. I loved this book. I loved it. I thought it was so good. I had so much fun reading this book. Although the proof copy has the smallest writing known to man, um, but I really, really enjoyed it. This book is about, oh, it's such a good concept. I think that's the thing. Like I've read so many like romance, um, light sort of beach reads, but usually they are relationship slash romance driven. It's about a relationship that's gone wrong or it's about finding the one or Mr. Right and that kind of thing. Whereas this, this book, I feel like the romance was a big part of the story, but it was kind of secondary to the actual plot. So the concept of this book is that Birdie Finch is a woman who kind of doesn't really know what she wants to do with her life. She hasn't really got any passions. Um, she's sort of just been fumbling and bumbling her way through life and her best friend, however, is a world-class wine expert. She's an amazing sommelier, she's trained, she's just seemingly got her shit together. But she's also got some relationship issues and so she turns down this seemingly amazing job at a hotel in Scotland to go away to Italy, I think, with this guy that she's been seeing. And she says to Birdie, our protagonist, um, can you turn down that job for me? Can you give them a call and turn that job down? And she's like, yeah, yeah, no worries. And then Birdie decides to take the job herself. She takes the job as a sommelier at this amazing hotel restaurant in Scotland and is all of a sudden neck deep in a job that she has no idea what she's meant to be doing. And I loved it. I loved that tension and I loved that, um, constant fear that she was gonna be found out. For some reason, I don't like watching things. I don't like watching tense or stressful things, but for some reason, reading them, I really enjoy it. I think it's because I'm in control of the pace. I can stop reading when it gets a little bit too much. When I'm watching, I feel like it's more happening to me and I have no control over watching tense and stressful things. Whereas when I'm reading them, I'm like, oh, I just need a little bit of a break from that. I'm gonna put the book down for a second and then come back to it when I feel able to read on. So The Summer Job by Lizzie Dent, I highly recommend, I really enjoyed it. Next on my list is The White Tiger by Aravind Adiga, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I am actually the founder slash part of a West End Women book club. Me and my friend Heba have been reading a lot recently, she read like 80 books last year which is partly where my reignited passion for reading came from. I was massively inspired by her and we decided to start up a book club for just our theatrical female friends. Um, so our February book was The White Tiger. We are discussing this next weekend and I'm really pleased we decided to read this because this isn't something that I would have picked up for myself, mainly because anytime I see winner of the Man Booker Prize, I instantly go, I'm too stupid to read that book. <laughs> so I am so pleased that we read this because I read it and I enjoyed it and more importantly, I understood what was going on. So The White Tiger is about a man called Balram, Balram. I always, in my head, said Balram, but I'm probably butchering it with my awful English accent, so I apologize if I have also got that wrong. And basically he realizes that the only way he's going to have a better life for himself is if he kills his master. I really struggle with works of fiction, whether they're books or movies or TV programs, where the protagonist is someone who is like morally inept or, some, or a protagonist who has to do something unforgivable regardless of 
of their situation. I really struggled with the beginning of Breaking Bad because I was like, no, I am not on Walter White's side. He's doing awful things. And other people have been in this situation and managed not to do awful things. So no, I'm not on board until I got like halfway through the seasons of Breaking Bad, I forget how many there are, but I got halfway through and I was like, no, he has to kill him for this reason and that reason. And I was completely justifying murder by the time we got halfway through Breaking Bad. So I kind of had the same thing with this where I was, I just struggled slightly with having a protagonist who is gonna murder someone basically. Um, but that being said, this book stayed with me a very long time after I'd read it. It's not a comfortable read because you're constantly introduced to living environments and people who are just not pleasant. Um, so it is a very uncomfortable read, but it's meant to be an uncomfortable read because it's meant to give you a taste of what that character's life is like and how difficult it is, which is why he is led to make the decision and do what he ends up doing. This has also just been made into a Netflix movie, so I'd be really interested to watch the Netflix movie now, now that I've read the book, and just to see how sort of close it was to what I was imagining. Because it's very rare that I read the book before I watch the movie. I always end up preferring the book to the movie, but I usually end up watching the movie first because I get round to reading the book much later on. So, excited. Maybe I'll watch that soon. The next book that I read is Mama Life by the wonderful Louise Pentland, who also happens to be a friend of mine. Louise and I had a little chat on a live stream um, very recently, so I read this book before I did the live stream just so that I was fully prepared because the live stream was to promote Mum Life coming out in paperback. Um, and it's so funny just because I, I know Louise relatively well, we're good friends, we have FaceTime chats very often, but even if you're like really good friends with someone, there's often stuff that you don't know about them because it's not stuff that would ever come up in like casual conversation. Um, you know, things that happened in your past that might not be hugely pleasant. Um, so there was a lot of stuff in this book that I didn't know about Louise and her life and her background and things that happened when she was younger that she would never have any reason to bring up in like everyday conversation. So it was, it was really interesting to read knowing Louise. Um, and I laughed, I cried, I just felt like this was Louise through and through as it should be because it's her book and she wrote it. It's good for you guys to know if you ever read this book, it's good for you guys to know that this is what Louise is really like. This is Louise, this is who she is. So you should all go read Mum Life because she's a wonderful person and also she mentions me in the book so you should all go read it just to see what, she, what lovely things she says about me. Next up, we have Lorelei by Laura Dockrill. Um, this was a book that I got in my box of stories. I ordered a young adult box of stories. For those of you that don't know what a box of stories is, um, it is a book subscription box that you can get once every month, every two months, three months, four months, however often um, you wanna get it. Um, and I ordered myself a young adult box to come every four months, I think. So this was one of the books I got in my first young adult box. It is about a mermaid called Lorelei um, who surfaces, which is when a mermaid goes up to the surface and ends up with legs. And when you resurface, you can't go back, I think. And she is found on the beach in Hastings um, by a boy called Rory and he's like, I don't know what to do because there's like, it's just this naked girl on the beach and he looks after her and discovers over time her story. Um, and Lorelei happens to be the daughter of the Queen of the Mermaids. And it's, it was really interesting because there was just so much about sort of the backstory of mermaids, like rules, like we all know like the rules of time travel, for instance, it's an entirely fictional thing, but we all know that when you go back in time, you can't change anything because it will screw up the, f the future or what is your present when you change something in the past. Like we all know those rules, but 
And vampires as well, like we all know the rules of vampires, we all know that vampires can't go out in the daytime and we can't, they can't see their own reflections, you know what I mean? There's certain rules about certain fictional things that we all know, but I don't really know what those fictional rules are for, for mermaids. And whether this is something that's just within this book, within the world that Laura Dockrill has created, or whether it's common knowledge amongst people who love stories about mermaids, I don't know. But there's just this whole idea about mermaids being salvaged. They are humans who have ended up in the ocean close to death, whether they've tried to take their own lives, whether they have ended up drowning um, when they've fallen off of boats, whether they've been thrown into the sea by somebody else. Um, they basically give off like an energy when they fall into the water that calls mermaids to them and those mermaids then turn that in distress human into a mermaid. So mermaids can't be born. I loved all of this. This whole like mermaid backstory I just thought was so, so great. And if anything, I kind of just wanted more of that. And also there, oh, there was a story within this book about Carmine, Carmine? Carmine is what I would go for. And Iris. There are two characters in this book where I was like, I want a whole book just about them. Carmine and Iris, for those of you that have read this book, for those of you that will read this book and suddenly find out who those characters are, I want a whole book just about those two characters. I was so invested in their story and yet their story was only like a chapter at most in this book. I want, I want their whole story and their whole romance. <laughs> Desperately. But I really enjoyed Lorelei. If mermaids is your kind of thing, this book is great. Also, the cover is brilliant. Look at those sparkly scales on the front of that cover. Beautiful. Okay, next, funny story. My next book is There's a Boy in the Girl's Bathroom by Louis Sacker. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, but this is the author of Holes, which is a story that I love. I don't think I ever read the book, but I watched the movie and I remember everyone reading the book actually at school when I was younger. However, I picked up this book thinking, for some reason, it was an LGBTQ plus type story. It is not. <laughs> it is not. That is not what this book is about. Um, but you can see how I thought that with the cover, surely the blue and the pink and the boy in the skirt. That's not what this book is. Um, so this book <laughs> is about a boy called Bradley Chalkers. Chalkers? Chalkers. Chalkers? Bradley Chalkers. Bradley Chalkers. Um, and he lies a lot, a bit of a troublemaker at school. I, I mean, he's, he's not, he is and he isn't. Um, I think he's just a very misunderstood child who tells lies to get attention and no one really understands how to deal with him um, and what would actually make him listen and pay attention in class. And so he just sort of acts out and tells lots of lies. None of the kids like him. They all think he's weird and that he's a troublemaker. All of the teachers who work in the school seem to just sort of avoid him and palm him off on other people until there is a counsellor who comes to the school called Carla who knows exactly how to get through to him, knows exactly how to speak to him. Um, and it's just a really sweet story. It's a really sweet story about a boy who's very misunderstood and is very different from the other children and learns how to believe in himself and learns how to make friends. And I think it's just a really sweet story. Definitely not what I expected when I picked it up. I thought the story was gonna be <laughs> something very different, um, but it was very sweet nonetheless. And it's also like 194 pages, 95 pages. So I read it in like an evening. It was lovely. <sighs> Next, my friends. Next, my friends, is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. And it is my favorite book of the year. It's one of those books where everyone's been talking about it. And I am usually, for some reason, when everyone's talking about a book or a movie or a TV series or something, for some reason, I dig my heels in and I'm like, I'm not gonna watch it yet. I'm gonna wait until everyone's calmed down about it and then I will read it, and then I will watch it. I don't know why I do that, but for some reason I've just got, I don't, I don't, I think I just don't like being told what to do. <laughs> I don't like being told, oh, you have to read this because you'll just love it, because then for some reason something in my brain goes, you know what, just because you've said that, I'm not gonna love it. Some irrational part of my brain just goes, well, because everyone's talking about it, I'm gonna find a reason to hate it. 
it's a problem I have that definitely needs fixing, but everyone talked about this book so much that I was like, I need to read it. I need to know what the hype is about. And boy, did I cry. I cried, I sobbed. Like 25 pages in, I was a mess, a mess. And that happened maybe like every 25 pages for the rest of the book. It's about this woman called Nora who, it's about this woman called Nora who has just lost every reason to live. At the beginning of the book, like every possible reason that she could have to stop her from taking her own life just falls apart and falls away from her. And she just decides that she's got nothing left to live for and decides that this is the night when she's going to take her own life. She wakes up in the Midnight Library or outside of the Midnight Library and basically the Midnight Library is a place where it is always midnight um, and all of these books on these shelves lead to a possible version of her life and she basically is given the task to find a life that she would like to live in. She can pick any one of these books and as soon as she feels disappointed by that life she'll be sucked back to the Midnight Library so she can pick another book. And she tries out all of these different lives that she could possibly live. At first she picked really simple lives, like a life where me and my boyfriend stayed together and we did get married. And then she starts getting really imaginative and she picks a life where she lives in Australia and she picks a life where she had um, a different job. And it's just great. It's just so good. It's so good. And again, it's a really short book. I think it's like 288 pages. Um, so this is a book that you could easily be done with in like two evenings. And it's just a joy. It's an absolute joy. And I loved every second of it. Every second I was in the Midnight Library, I just had the best time. It upsets me how good this book is because I wish I'd written it. There is a reason that this book is at number one. <sighs> This book is so good, I loved it. You should all read it, it's great. You will cry. Finally, I finished that book on Friday and I thought I've got two days left of February. I can definitely fit in one last book. And so I decided to pick up a very short book. It's 150 pages. I picked The Sense of an Ending by Julian Barnes, which is a book that my friend Johnny Vickers recommended to me. In fact, I think he bought this for me um, seven years ago seven years ago, 2014, he bought me this book. So Johnny, if you're watching, so sorry that it took me this long to read it. This book is one of those books where it's, it's not necessarily one where you can be like, I really enjoyed it because the story is so, um, slightly confusing. Again, it's a protagonist where he's not massively likable. And basically the whole sort of point of the book is that memory isn't as reliable as you think it is. And basically there's so much about the story that I don't want to say because it is such a short book and so the more I say the less I'm leaving for you to discover in the 150 pages that it has. Um, but basically it's about this guy who remembers things happening sort of in his favour when he was growing up. And then the more he starts to remember, now that he's like much, much older, the more he realizes that actually maybe he was at fault and he did things in a way that basically he handled things far worse than he thought he did. And maybe the way things turned out were because of him. This is a book that I feel like I'm gonna need to think about for the next like week and just sort of wrap my head around the story and what I think and feel about this story. But it's definitely worth a read um, if you need a little bit of sort of like a head scratcher. Um, and I feel like everything happens and like everything comes together in like the last 10 pages. Um, for a lot of this book, I was sort of like reading and then rereading because I just wasn't quite absorbing the story in the way that I wanted to. And then I got to like the last, the last 10, 20 pages and I, I was gutted that it was gonna be ending that soon. I was like, no, 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 this is like just picking up and just getting really good. And then all of a sudden it's over and you're like, ah, oh, I don't know what just happened to me. I feel like that book just happened to me as opposed to me reading it. If you want a head scratcher, The Sense of an Ending by Julian Barnes is the one for you. So there we go. I think it's pretty good going. Eight books in February in a relatively short month. 
Um, I also read The Lucky Escape twice and I read my own book as well, but I won't include those because that's being, that's being cheeky. Um, but yeah, there we go. I am thrilled with how that month went. I probably won't be as, um, I don't know, will I be as good at reading this month? I don't know. I start rehearsals for Cinderella this week. Rehearsals started today, although I'm not needed until Wednesday. Um, so we'll see, but I'm hoping to read as many books this month. So yeah, if you've got any book recommendations, please let me know. I think I'm also gonna do a, um, a TBR video soon because I have some books arriving tomorrow that I am very excited about them arriving. All I've done in my spare time in the last few weeks is watch booktubers and bookstagrammers and just compile a list of books that I'm really excited to read. And I ordered some and a few are arriving tomorrow and I cannot wait. So yeah, my book reading flame has been reignited. So stay tuned for more of that. Goodbye. <laughs>